In the name of emotional well-being, college students are increasingly demanding protection from words and ideas that they don't like. I wonder if that'll prove disastrous for the next generation. Well, our correspondent Juan Garcia went undercover as a student to find out. A movement is arising, undirected and driven largely by students to scrub campuses clean of words, ideas, and subjects that might cause discomfort or give offense. There's like designated areas where people go when they get their feelings hurt. Okay. Have you heard of anything like I, that? I vaguely know, yeah, I okay. vaguely know what that is. I've heard of it. We have a free speech zone. It's over by the parking lots near the football field. Our freedom of speech shouldn't be limited, but it should be utilized in like better fashion. And if individuals feel like they are threatened by that kind of speech, then I feel like in those sorts of situations, I feel like it would be appropriate to, I guess, I guess hinder that kind of talk a little bit. Do you think this generation is a little bit too coddled or soft? Yes. No, I don't think that. I think that we're just a little bit more hyper aware of the state of things, you know what I mean? I would say no. Um, I think that the generation before us thinks that things should be their way. I don't think we're too sensitive. I think we're finally realizing a lot of the consequences of our actions, especially our words. People are like just too worried about like getting offended. Communication has been lost in this generation, unfortunately. It's a lot more technology-based rather than face-to-face. -face. People let words get to them a little too easily now. I believe that our society has kind of grown sensitive. Uh, I've always been taught to, you know, rise above that. My first guest is a champion of free speech on college campuses and co-author of one of the New York Times' 100 notable books of 2018. It's called The Coddling of the American Mind. From F-I-R-E, that's FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. Please welcome Greg Lukanoff. Greg, first of all, your book is, uh, it's caught fire because you're talking about something that is incredibly timely, something called free speech. What's happened to it in America? Well, you know, freedom of speech, that, that's my life's calling. It's why I went to law school. It's what I specialized in. I got snickered out a little bit by other students um, by specializing in First Amendment. They're like, oh, you'll never find a job in that. And it's what I've been doing for, you know, close to 20 years now. Um, the sad thing is, though, even though I was very well grounded in the, in the history of freedom of speech going back centuries, I was not prepared, even in 2001, for how easy it was to get in trouble for what you say on a college campus. Today, college campuses are the instruments of shutting down free expression. When did this trend really happen? It was only around 2013, 2014 that we started seeing um, uh, students themselves suddenly become, uh, uh, suddenly demanding what, what, what I called one book, freedom from speech. Uh, and it, it seemingly, seemingly happened overnight. It went from students actually being quite good on free speech to students demanding disinvitations, demanding trigger warnings, microaggression policies. And the book, uh, Coddling the American Mind, is uh, trying to get to the bottom of what changed so quickly. Well, Greg, let's talk about it. if I were sitting in a college campus auditorium and you were the speaker and I raised yep. my hand and asked, OK, so why should I let you say whatever you want if it offends me? What is the value of free speech to me as a college student? Most of human history, we should all remember, is when you don't like so what someone has to say, you chop their head off, burn them at the stake, crucify them, make them drink hemlock. <laughs> it was an incredible innovation to actually start listening to people who you disagreed with, and sometimes actually recognizing that they might be right about things. So it's a very fragile, fragile right, and every generation um, comes forward with a new rationale for ending freedom of speech. Um, and ultimately, in a democracy, if, particularly if you're in the numerical minority, Minority, you have to remember, in democracy, if you're part of the majority, the vote will take care of you. But if you're a minority, um, you, need, you need freedom of speech. You need the First Amendment. And it's amazing that I have to explain this basic civics on campus all the time. In a world where people say we've got to be tolerant, we have to be mm -hmm. uh, loving and caring and, and open-minded, there is no open-mindedness and tolerance when political correctness takes over. I don't understand why particularly young people can't see the irony of that. I've been asked a lot, what's the greatest threat to freedom of speech? And I think the greatest freedom of speech, uh, threat to freedom of speech is complacency and ignorance. And you can't blame students too much about not understanding freedom of speech or for that matter civics or the Constitution if nobody's explained it to them. And the states of civics education in the U.S. right now is, is really terrible. And what I would really love every college in the country to do is to explain academic freedom, freedom of speech. Um, a freedom of inquiry uh, on the first day of school, but virtually no, no colleges do that.
What are we missing, though, in terms of, of explaining that freedom of speech means you're going to hear some things that you disagree with and some things that are absolutely, unbelievably yep. offensive, even profane and vulgar, but that too is yep. a part of the free speech process that we have. Yes, and I think p people get a little lost in kind of like how freedom of speech is supposed to lead you to like the platonic form of truth, when really one of the most important values of freedom of speech is it lets you know what people really think. And that's important, especially if what they think is troubling. In the day of social media where people can say outrageous things on social media, Media. Sometimes they may get booted off Twitter or YouTube for yep. it. But generally, uh, as long as a person remains anonymous, they seem to be able to get by with a lot more than if they put their face and name to what they're saying. That seems yep. ridiculous to me. Help me understand, how do, we, how do we change that mindset? When it comes to the anonymous troll, the idea that we would give up freedom of speech, that we would sort of sour on freedom of speech because they're jerks out there who, who, who like to troll you anonymously, we should start treating um, internet trolls the same way we would treat graffiti scrawled on a bathroom wall. It's not even worth engaging. Brilliant assessment. I can't agree more. Well, Greg, thank you very much. And I want to tell our audience you can find The Coddling of the American Mind online and at bookstores everywhere. Well, maybe not the campus bookstores, I'm not sure. But learn more about FIRE at thefire.org. That's thefire.org. Follow Greg on Twitter. I have a feeling you're going to enjoy him.